ever since the launching of the law enforcement operation in Tigray against the terrorist PLF, several Western media have been portraying the Ethiopian government's move in the negative manner. Only few independent journalists in the West have tried to report the truth on the ground. Anne Garrison is one of the independent American journalists who have been writing several articles to help the international community see the truth in Ethiopia. Mirs Garrison has received the Victor Ingabire Umahosa Democracy and Peace Prize for her reporting on the conflict in the African Great Lake regions. Currently, Mirs Garrison is in Ethiopia witnessing war torn places in the country. Ethiopian news agency reporter Henok Tadela has approached her regarding some current issues. In the first place, unfettered access, that's an unreasonable demand. There's been a war going on here. You can't expect a government that's at war to simply open the doors and let anyone who, who wants to go into the war zone. That's unreasonable. And you know, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable for there to be checkpoints to make sure there are no weapons going in because somehow or other, after a war starts, both sides have to be resupplied with munitions. And so one has to ask, where are the munitions that the TPLF are fighting with coming from? And there are only a few possibilities. One is Sudan, if they can get through, if they can get through Amhara region, or what is called Western Tigray, or by air, or by truck by the aid trucks. Now, I'm not saying that there are weapons in the aid trucks. I don't know, but there are only three possibilities that I can think of. One is, is cross-border, well, airplanes from Addis or airplanes from across the border. Uh, so that's why it's, it's unreasonable to demand unfettered access. And if they, I don't know that this is true, but if they have been demanding unfettered access for all this time, and now they've got it, and the aid is not there to go in, well, the world should know that. I think the United States should stay out of this and let Ethiopians settle their own problems, their own relations with one another. And I realize that you have many ethnicities and languages and that many groups have past grievances with one another. And I just came back from Gondor, in the University of Gondor, where the horrific um, ethnic cleansing attacks and ethnic cleansing of Amhara people by the TPLF when they occupied that part of the country was being exposed. And I thought, well, this is horrific. This is horrific, and yes, it should be, it should be studied further. The professors who had studied it for a year thought it required further study and that there should be a mu museum to commemorate it. And I agree. I just hope that the result would be more of an end to ethnic politics than an exacerbation of ethnic politics. And I hope that the national dialogue will address all of that, the challenge of creating citizenship that is more important than ethnicity, but without destroying ethnic tradi traditions. I mean, languages, dance, music, culture, that's all important and, and there's no reason to destroy that. Um, it's sad when cultures are destroyed like that, but for Ethiopia to emerge as a really strong nation, you need to have success at this national dialogue, obviously, and create a sense of Ethiopian citizenship. And Ethiopia has so much potential.
Well, unfortunately, um, my country doesn't, and my country's policymakers don't practice what they preach. What they do is usually the opposite of what they say they're going to do. Any country in the world, when they hear the U.S. is going to bring them some democracy, they should get ready for trouble. <laughs> There's nothing more dangerous than the U.S. bringing you some democracy. And as you've said, you finally had your first democratic election. And since then, the U.S. has been trying to unseat Prime Minister Abiy and the Prosperity Party. And that's what the sanctions are meant to do. The sanctions are meant to cause so much pain that Ethiopians will rise up and try to remove Abiy and the party. And, and, you know, I've talked to some people who are happy with Abiy, some who aren't, but you have another election in two years, right? Yeah, okay, so... You should settle that. <laughs> we shouldn't be trying to make the economy scream. That's, that's the phrase that, that has been used since the 1970s when Henry Kissinger used it with regard to inter interventions in Chile. Um, we shouldn't be trying to make the economy scream so that people will overthrow Abiy. That's wrong. That's very, very wrong. First, let's say there's a big difference between the U.S. government and the people of the U.S. The people of the U.S. don't understand this well at all, and they're not very well educated in ge geography and international politics. Uh, for the most part, they don't even know that there is such a thing as international law. I mean, there are people who go to law school, and they don't know that there's international law. Sanctions are illegal according to international law. That doesn't stop the U.S. from imposing sanctions all over the world. One third of the world is now under U.S. sanctions. What good, what good do they get from it? S tiny elites may benefit. Um, tiny elites with resource interests in the region, uh, military interests who simply want control. I think there's something there's something beyond the material interests, which is just a determination to control the rest of the world. And I've been thinking about this, and you know, I'm afraid that a country whose primary industrial product is weapons, its primary export is weapons, has to, has to be committed to force. How could you make that your primary industrial product and your primary export without being committed to the use of force? Now, this is, this is economic force, but it's the same idea. We're going to force you to do what we want. I, at first, I was afraid, at the beginning of this conflict, I was afraid that the U.S. might send in troops. I no longer think that that is likely. But the sanctions, if they're passed, they could be really punishing. But, you know, Eritrea has survived decades of sanctions. And they still have very high quality of life indicators. Uh, low infant mortality, high literacy rate, high rate of rural electrification, um, high rate of women's education, health, uh, life expectancy. Um, so they've demonstrated that it is possible to survive sanctions if necessary. It might be difficult, but it's possible to survive. I hope we can stop them. I really hope we can stop them. When I am on American media about this, last week I was on an American radio station, and, and I always say, look, I know you don't understand this very well, because there isn't any good reporting about it in the United States. The headlines are all full of lies, propaganda. But the one thing you can do, and, and the people I speak to, they know that sanctions are bad, is call your representative, call your senators, tell them not to pass House Resolution 6600 or Senate Bill 3199. I think it's a disgrace. 
I wrote a piece that's in an online publication called The Gray Zone about Dr. Tedros, and he should not be using his position. In his position, he is sworn to political neutrality. That's in various UN Charter documents and WHO documents. Uh, and he says constantly that the world's worst humanitarian crisis is in Tigray. He says it's worse than Ukraine. I have never heard him mention the crisis in Amhara or Afar. I haven't seen Afar, but I have seen Amhara, and the suffering is horrible. I mean, I saw people without it in IDP camps in Sokoto without enough food or water, far from enough food or water, uh, only only a few, one, one of three IDP camps had mattresses to sleep on, and there were no sanitation facilities that I could see. In one, it, in one case, it was particularly bad because there were animals around with, with where the, in the same place the people were, and the people were right on the edge of town. These are people who desperately need help in these camps around Sokota. And I was told by Jamal Countess, the photographer that I was traveling with, that there are IDP camps all up and down the A2, mm -hmm. and the A2 highway, and we went to one of them, mm -hmm. and it was very bad. So it, it doesn't make any sense for him to be constantly insisting that all the pain in Tigray, all the pain is in Tigray, mm -hmm. um, because I've seen the pain in Amhara, mm -hmm. and I don't doubt that it's there in Afar as well. So it, it's an argument used to justify intervention, whether it's intervention with sanctions or military intervention. And now I think the sanctions are more likely, but I, I believe he's actively lobbying for the sanctions. It hasn't been in the headlines. If you went in, if you went to Google and you searched for Ethiopia, you would see all the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International News, more and more people reporting that, and then politicians keep commenting on the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International reports. And Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are part of this machine cre created to overthrow governments that the U.S. doesn't like because they're too independent. Like I said, the U.S. just can't seem to tolerate independence. But there are nations all over the world now. Most recently, we see Pakistan rising up, saying that they don't want the U.S. telling them what to do anymore. <laughs> um, well, Kite didn't even make the headlines. I, I didn't see a single headline outside the Ethiopian press. I talked a little bit about it on the radio program that I was on in the United States last week. And I, I will, write, I will write, write something specifically about that to see if I can generate at least one headline. I mean, I write for one publication that typically manages to get in the headlines. It's, you know, but people who just search for Ethiopia now, all they would find was, would be the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International report. And the story from, from Gondor, from the University of Gondor, should get out to the world, especially the world that's been told that they should intervene in Ethiopia because of the suffering in Tigray. Uh, part of this machine created to overthrow other governments is uh, this, this focus, this, this, this strategy of focusing on one minority and say that minority is doing all the suffering, and therefore we must intervene on behalf of that minority uh, to prevent genocide. And the same thing happened in Libya, the same thing happened in Syria.